Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. My name is Adi and today I'm going to be doing something a little bit different. So today I want to look over some of the sets from week one of the NPA. If you aren't familiar with NPA, it is the National Pokemon Association and it is probably the most prestigious VGC team tournament. It features a number of the top players in the world competing for the title of NPA champion and I am on the new Bark Loud Puppies for the third straight year, and this year we are the defending champions. So definitely really excited to be playing again this year, excited to compete against some of the best players in the world. And this year I want to showcase some of the more interesting sets or sets that stand out to me. Uh, I personally have learned a lot from this competition, not just by playing in it, but also just by watching and being on the teams and really paying attention to other games. You can see a lot of really interesting teams. A lot of times you, the teams you see here are the teams that people will later bring to regionals or just sort of trying out proof of concepts. So it's definitely something to keep an eye on. And obviously there's a lot of really high quality Pokemon being played. So uh, just want to show off some of the replays. Of course, I did play this week. I played against Pontus, who is a Swedish player, uh, and I had a really, really phenomenal set with him. Uh, I managed to win 2-1, and my team managed to win the week 6-2. Eight players play per team per week. Uh, if you want to watch my set, I will link the Google Doc that I'm looking at in the description so you can see uh, all, the, all the replays from every single week. But uh, I'm not going to cover my game. I want to cover some of the games I want to watch personally and look over. And so going over the results, I guess. Uh, I mean, first off, I mean, look at this. We got we got week one. We got Serapis versus Bingji. Serapis and Bingji are two of the top ten players in North America when the circuit ended uh, last year. I mean, it just doesn't get much better than that. Um, Paul Chua and Jeremy Adena, I think, were eighth and ninth in North America when the circuit ended uh, in 2020. So. Really, really phenomenal. Although the uh, the set that I want to watch first is Chef versus Iker. Um, Chef is maybe one of the most creative team builders in North America. Always comes up with something really unique. And Iker is a Spanish player, I believe. But he's been he is using this Palkiaization team that obviously I'm a big fan of uh, this format. And I used the same six Pokemon in the Eternamax Cup a couple weeks ago to go 4-0, and my team won the Eternamax Cup. Not the, not the puppies, just a different team. Um, but uh, I've also saw that Hannah used this team to get the one seed in the Hatterin series before losing in top 16. So this is a team that's been floating around for a little bit and has seen a lot of success. And I kind of want to see, uh, one, I want to watch what Chef did because he's obviously a really fun player to watch. But also I want to see how he managed to beat this team and maybe some of the weaknesses of this team, uh, both for me personally to maybe develop on it, but also just uh, as a learning experience. So I guess let's jump over to that game. All right, so I pulled up their set, and uh, I guess let's just go through it. So um, I care, of course, running the uh, the Zacian Palkia team. This, this the more standard version of it now is a special Thunderous with Incineroar, Rillaboom, or Amoongus. I've seen both on this team, and then Ditto. Uh, and the uh, other team is the Chef's team is Calibrex, Zacian, Thunderous, Whimsicott, uh, Darmanitan Ice, uh, or Darmanitan Galar, and Urshifu. Presumably Urshifu Dark. One thing that uh, I would point out, not knowing Chef's team, is that normally Thunderous is physical on this sort of team because you really want the Incineroar deterrent. You don't want them to lead it into a team that otherwise looks pretty weak to Incineroar. And so uh, it, Chef leading Thunderous Calyrex into Zacian Thunderous, and uh, I mean, let's just see what happens. This is a pretty volatile game state, but uh, so I care going for Thunder Wave into Calyrex and then Behemoth Blade into Thunderous. So um, this is pretty interesting. It's like Thunderous presumably is running Eerie Impulse, so uh, you could have gone for Eerie Impulse to reduce the damage, instead choosing to reduce the speed, even though its speed is going to be boosted by this Thunderous. Uh, I guess Thunderous doesn't have a really profitable Airstream target, although we did see that it just targeted the Zacian with Airstream. But um, yeah, it's interesting that uh, he went for the speed reduction instead of the damage reduction. It uh, seems to mean that he doesn't mind these Pokemon going down and he thinks he can reverse sweep with whatever he has in back, because obviously these two Pokemon, Thunderous Calyrex, are going to do a lot of damage on the field right now if uh, their damage isn't reduced in some way. And then, of course, Behemoth Blade going to Thunderous, meaning uh, he values the damage on there. So actually, I think that if he's not going for Eerie Impulse, it means that there's a Ditto in back, and the Ditto wants to switch in um, to to turn into this Calyrex, and the Calyrex is slow now, so obviously it won't add speed. Uh, and then the damage into Thunderous is really helpful because now it's going to put it into uh, Astral Barrage range, especially if he, the Calyrex is allowed to take some boosts. The one scary thing is that Calyrex nowadays are very often Focus Sash, and so uh, if I care can't get chip into this Calyrex, then it's just going to, you know, it's going to live a hit and KO the Ditto back. 
Um, so that might not be great. But right now, I put my money on uh, Palkia Ditto being the, the two back months. Um, and yeah, so we see Airstream, we see Astro Barrage not picking up the KO uh, as expected. And then, um, so, okay, so the Thunder is not clicking Eerie Impulse, so definitely Ditto and back, right? Uh, doesn't really have a profitable way to. I guess you could have Eerie Impulse a Thunderous and then switched and then turned your Ditto into a Thunderous, uh, which is kind of a funny line. Um, but yeah, going for something a little more consistent. Um, I would I actually, yeah, probably more consistent. I guess we also find out if Thunderous outspeeds Calyrex at plus one, but I don't think it does. Uh, oh, never mind. The Calyrex had a second speed boost. Uh, so Astro Barrage coming out, taking two KOs. Uh, basically, I mean, yeah, so here comes the Ditto, just giving the Ditto this plus two. But if it's Sash Calyrex, I think that then. There's nothing much that Iker can do. The Calyrex is just going to take the KO, and then it's going to be... Yeah, and there's the Sash, so it's going to be uh, Palkia versus the World. Palkia not going to be able to do this. Um, Ditto, of course... Okay, so I guess... So Ditto is normally um, Scarf, right? So the Paralysis doesn't matter. The Paralysis isn't going to make the Calyrex not outspeed the Ditto, uh, like you might hope. And so I think that maybe turn one was supposed to be like a Thunderbolt into Calyrex, Um I mean, this game's over, right? So, yeah, so, like, if turn one was a... Th so, the damage had to go into the Thunderous with the Zation, because otherwise you don't get to uh, KO with the Astral Barrage, even a plus two. But uh, the th if the Thunderous went for Thunderbolt into Calyrex here, then... I mean, then, then the Ditto would dip a little more for rain, but I guess also these Calyrex are very often running Will-O-Wisp, and so if you don't... If the Calyrex outspeed Zation and Will-O-Wisps, then maybe you don't get the damage off into the Thunderous that you need to KO with Astral Barrage. So I guess that's kind of counterplay to that. But um, yeah, okay. So, and then moving forward a couple turns, uh, the, the takes a KO and then let's see if we see any information. Maybe see player off on Zation. I don't think he should reveal that. Uh, we do see it's Life Warp Thunderous. I guess we saw that a couple turns ago. Uh, no information revealed. Uh, you know, Chef's an experienced player. He knows not to give up information when he doesn't have to, especially with teams where you might not really know what exactly is going on. Um, like Chef's team. So I guess let's see how Iker adjusts. Uh, same leads as last time. Um, and same Dynamax. Uh, okay, so this time Thunderous did not go for a priority move, so presumably it is going for uh, Thunderbolt. And Zacian, uh, I mean, guess the critical hit on Thunderous, so that just means it immediately goes down. Um, I guess like, so uh, the Thunderbolt comes into Calyrex, not too surprising, kind of what would have worked last game, but... Uh, you know, if that if that Thunderous was attacking the other Thunderous, then maybe that picks up the KO. We saw that Astro Barrage into Max Airstream didn't KO Thunderous last game, I believe. And so uh, maybe it had to be Max Lightning, which doesn't seem that good. But he, or it would have to be it would have to, it would be a call out for this play specifically. But the Behemoth Blade crating kind of turns all that off and puts Iker in a pretty good position now that the Calyrex is chipped. So, uh, Thunder Wave going to Zacian, yeah, so, like, really doesn't want to Eerie Impulse the Calyrex, as you might expect if you didn't have Ditto. Uh, Trick, oh, oh, wait, what? <laughs> okay, so, Trick Room coming up, really interesting. Um, the, so, Zacian's trade damage, um, and Zacian coming down to 6%. Also, Zacian doing 94 to the opposing Zacian means that it is just min bulk Zacian, for sure. Uh, and, I, th I assume, I think I know my Zacian calcs pretty well, uh, and so, Behemoth Blade coming out, taking the KO. Palkia comes in, um, but Trick Room is up. Trick Room meaning that, like, Chef knew that that there was a Ditto in back, correctly read that, correctly read that he needed to not take the KO on Thunderous, and if he did, he was in a really awful spot. So, uh, cool tech. Um, Palkia is not in a great spot if there's player off on Zacian, because I would imagine that, like, okay, if Zacian goes for player off, does 80% to Palkia or whatever, uh, and then, you know, Thunderous gets to attack before the Calyrex, but, uh, and the Palkia gets to attack before the Calyrex, but, like, at that point, maybe you're just too low. Actually, no, it's probably fine, right? As long as the Zacian doesn't KO with Play Rough, then, um, Palkia KO Zacian, uh, or, sorry, Palkia KOs Calyrex, Zacian, Thunderous KO Zacian, um, and you're fine. Uh, so we do see the switch out here. Palkia Dynamax is as expected. Taunt, um... Wait, so taunt, if you taunt, why would you taunt the Calyrex? I don't get it. Right, because if there was a player off and then an Astro Barrage coming out, don't you just lose? Um, interesting play then, I guess. Uh, but we do see the uh, the Palkia taking the KO. 
Uh, ditto coming in. So ditto, assuming this Urshifu, this is Urshifu Dark, he has Sucker Punch, um, just kind of locks the Calyrex in, yeah. And then Calyrex never had a button they could click. Uh, Palkia, okay, so we did see, I mean, we saw the, the Focus Eye. So unsurprisingly, banned Urshifu does go down. And we also see that Palkia isn't timid because it, uh, it undersped the Urshifu in Trick, or outsped the Urshifu in Trick Room, underspeeds it normally. Not too surprising. I don't think most Palkia are timid. Anyways, so uh, I guess moving on to game three, um, even though the Trick Room play was kind of cool, it didn't really do enough because Palkia kind of outdamaged everything. Yeah, okay. So uh, this time, Chef leads Whimsicott. So changing it up a little bit, Thunderous may be a little too linear. Um, Whimsicott is really terrifying in game three when you haven't seen a game one and two because they can run so many moves. You don't know if it's like Trick Eject button, which is pretty reasonable on this team. Um, you don't know if it also has Trick Room, although I wouldn't imagine it does. Uh, you don't know if it has Fake Tears or Helping Hand or Protect or Tailwind. I mean, obviously it has Tailwind. Um, also, just Palkia generally, I think, struggles with Whimsicott because it does have perfect defensive typings for Palkia's three normal attacks, which are uh, Ground, Water, uh, Dragon. And so... Uh, yeah, I, I like the adjustment for Chef bringing Whimsicott in. Um, also, if Whimsicott has Taunt, it entirely invalidates the Thunderous, right? So that's a another play that Chef can do if he has it. Just like really, really scary situation for Ikir. Uh, let's see what happens. Okay, so Calyrex maxes Helping Hand. Okay, so just going, ooh, okay. So just going all in, trying to take a KO, presumably on the Zacian. I don't think you need to do that if you're trying to KO Thunderous. Uh, but we do see Eerie Impulse come out. And so maybe Chef just said, you know, you don't have Eerie Impulse. You haven't clicked it before. Uh, and yeah, I mean, let's, let's see what happens. Uh, this shouldn't KO. It, yeah, de definitely doesn't KO, um, from Sash Calyrex especially. And then Zacian go, Zacian goes for sub. Okay. I don't think I like sub here. I think that like, you take the damage, like sub is not, eh, it, maybe it's okay, but like sub is trading for an attack and the attack was kind of, uh, Okay, knowing that the Calyrex Dynamaxes sub is pretty reasonable, if you don't think the, ca sub is, the Calyrex is going to Dynamax, I don't think it does very much, right? Because Astro Barrage is breaking sub anyways, so you're like, they're clicking Astro Barrage turn two, and you're stuck, you know, you're just, you're just trading your turn for an attack, but you're at lower health. I, I, I don't like that play. I don't like the sub, even though it kind of worked out here. Um, okay, so moving on, we see a Max Guard, we see the attack into Max, okay, double up. Double up into Calyrex, even though it's a minus two. Kind of interesting. We know that the Whimsicott isn't sash because the calyrex is sash so the, the behemoth blade would have ko'd it but there's also like a very very valid question about whether you want to ko it and just like give the uh give the pokemon a free switch in tailwind so i think it's pretty reasonable not to take the ko although i guess the thunder doesn't have taunt because you probably taunt the whimsicott if you have it just to, like kind of turn it off uh i don't think KOing the calyrex when it's at minus two is very important either and so here we see the calyrex doubling up into thunderous uh and the whimsicott uh the Chef doubling up into Thunderous. Ikear doubling up into Calyrex, getting rid of it. So that was a turn where I think I would consider KOing Whimsicott. Because you're getting the free switch in anyways, but the Whimsicott is such a problem for the Palkia, whereas the minus two Calyrex is really not. So, I don't know. Um, especially since the Calyrex could have very reasonably broken the Zacian sub here uh, as like a last-ditch attack. Okay, and then Behemoth Blade breaks sub. Behemoth Blade does 90% back. Yep, we saw that already. Um, just no protects coming out, just, just taking the KOs. I mean, the Thunderous can't click any status moves. So yeah, that play was really safe for Chef, taking two KOs. Um, yeah, and so here, I think the game is like, the game's kind of over, right? Like, Ditto, it, Whimsicott gets to click Tailwind for free, right? Uh, Zacian outspeeds Ditto and gets to Behemoth Blade it, and Ditto can't protect. Uh, and so Ditto, because that has less bulk, will always get KO'd by Behemoth Blade. And then it's just Whimsicott and a Pokemon in back versus a Max Palkia, and I imagine that Whimsicott wins that. Uh, I mean, I guess we'll see, right? Like, it, it, it shouldn't be that. Okay, so yeah, Tailwind, Behemoth Blade taking the KO. Um, Palkia has to KO the Zacian, yeah. So Max Quake just getting that Spadef boost so that it doesn't die to Whimsicott as easily. I still think, okay, Inertia comes in, I still think Whimsicott is favored here. Um... Right, it's just it's just like Moonblast. Uh, close combat is slightly better. Maybe maybe you run, maybe you if you don't think you die to a Max Quake, you click Wicked Blow so you don't get the drop. Um, helping Hand, Helping Hand. Okay, uh, let's, let's 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 watch the play. Oh no, okay, I'm okay. Lots on back. First off, Helping Hand instead of Moonblast is questionable because I feel like. 
I understand that Pock is a plus one to death. So maybe Moon Moonblast does we Moonblast does more. But on the other hand, uh, so I'm not sure about that. On the other hand, Wormwind is definitely not the play. Wormwind does nothing. Um, because you were always you knew that your Shifu was in Sash. You are always KOing your Shifu. That is something that you could I I'm hundred percent sure of. You could have clicked Geyser, and then your Geyser does more into Whimsicott. Or if you think that it clicks close combat, you can click Max Quake, and then you are more likely to live attacks in Whimsicott later in the game. I don't think Max Quake has Urshifu, which is why I thought that maybe Urshifu shouldn't have clicked Close Combat and should have clicked Wicked Blow, uh, just to play for that, because Close Combat and Wicked Blow do the same damage, but Close Combat can crit, um, whereas Wicked Blow always crits, so, which is why it does the same damage. So I would think that that was the play. Uh, I, think, I think you're supposed to click Geyser, because then you have a chance to KO the non-Sash Whimsicott. I don't know this calc off the top of my head, but I think that I care through. I think that it was always supposed to be Geyser, and if he clicked Geyser, then he has a chance to win. Um, yeah, so here we see the Quake does 54, um, and Moonblast is going to KO because it's the last turn of Dynamax next turn. Um, Quake doing 54, so Geyser, on that means has Stab Boost, and they're both not very effective, does about 70-something, and then with the Rain up, another 50% boost, it should KO. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to calc this. Okay, so I pulled up the damage calc, and uh, we see that Max Geyser... Not in rain does is a roll to KO min bulk whimsicott. So in rain, I mean, even if it's like max HP, this is KOing. So yeah, I definitely think that I care was supposed to uh, click max geyser into Urshifu just to guarantee the KO. Um, and as far as whether Moonblast did more damage, Moonblast is doing about 20%. Uh, well, plus one spit def. I guess we already saw that. And then um, Urshifu's close combat with choice band is doing uh, 48 to 50, 45 to 54, um, with Helping Hand is doing 68. So yeah, okay, so Chef did the right playing by clicking Helping Hand, it does do slightly more damage um, than clicking the other moves, and then really was not supposed to win that. Iker was really supposed to take that by clicking Max Geyser. Uh, so yeah, so that's kind of an unfortunate way for this to end, but yeah, uh, definitely was, uh, I mean, in interesting game for sure. Uh, it's good to good to see that like good good something that you can learn from. Um, just should have. Oh, I guess also the other question is does Max Quake KO? Uh, and Max Quake, yeah, you see here if it's Minbalk or Shifu, Max Quake is a roll to KO. So he so I could just just click the one move that that lost him the game. I think Max Quake or Max Geyser both would have put him in a pretty good spot to to take that one. But um, yeah, it was just really not supposed to click Max Wormwind there. Just never ever was. And it's supposed to click Max Wormwood when you know it's a choice band or Shifu. But yeah, definitely um, a good showcase of both teams. Um, showcasing how Ditto can be very useful in a lot of different situations against Calyrex especially. Maybe the things to consider when you're playing against it. And yeah, sadly, uh, no Darmanitan sighting, but this was definitely a fun set to watch. Okay, so scrolling back up through the matches. Um, so here we see the, the Stars lose to the Samurais. Um, and... Uh, I mean, Gavin. Well, I'm playing the uh, the Samurais next week, uh, and uh, we I'm matched up with Gavin Michaels, King of Mars. So this should be a, this should be a fun matchup. And of course, he is also a Palkia aficionado. So definitely going to be exciting there. But I'm not going to showcase that replay just because I've already seen it and already kind of know how it goes. Um, but here we see the uh, the Blizzards and the Symbionts tied, and uh, the first match is just another just haymaker. It is Maluka and Krellcroc, two of the best Korean players, maybe the two best Korean players uh, playing against each other. And I definitely want to see this. They're both really creative team builders. Um, Krellcock is using the Palkia Calyrex Ice team that I think I've seen do well in uh, in the IC as well. So uh, this should be a good match too. All right. And before I get into the match, I do want to uh, quickly plug the new Bark Lad puppies are, uh, if you want to watch the matches live, we do post a schedule every week, so you can um, you can check out when exactly the matches are happening. Most of them are on Pokemon Showdown, and uh, if you are in the NPA Discord, which is anyone can join, then um, you can get pinged for any of the matches when they happen. So definitely something to watch out for if you're interested in watching these games live. Yeah, so here we see Maluka on the far side taking on Krellcroc or Disney Lando on the near side. Uh, and let's jump into it. So we see uh, Mimikyu and... Okay, so right off the bat... Uh, we see that uh, that Krellcock is really worried about Trick Room going up, right? And this is a Trick Room team. Um, or at least it seems like a Trick Room team. It does have a Regielki on it, but 
like the Palkia can learn Trick Room and it just can act as a secondary Trick Room setter. But like Mimikyu and Calyrex are a really interesting dynamic, right? Because Mimikyu can KO his Shadow Sneak, but Calyrex is also one of the few Pokemon that just outrides KOs Mimikyu once you chip it. And so this lead from Aluka is putting a lot of pressure on basically all of uh, of Krell's uh, potential Trick Room setters, other than maybe um, maybe then like other than maybe a Palkia potentially. And so this should be interesting just because this seems like a pretty favorable lead for Maluka here. Uh, it also might be like a Max Eleki, but no, we just see the Electorb coming out. Um, do we see a Life Orb? Uh, no, I don't think so. Yeah, we do see a Life Orb. Okay, so that's good to know. And then Astro Barrage is just... Oh, wait, what? So this is a really specially bulky Mimikyu, right? Um, I saw the damage calc up. I can pull that up. Uh, Caloric Shadow. Um, I don't think we saw a Life Orb because we saw the Life Orb Eleki. Um, into Mimikyu. Yeah, so this is like... This is straight up. That can't be right, can it? Oh, it's... Oh, I see. It's the nature. It's... This is this is quite literally... Okay, so it did low roll, but it's literally max, max Mimikyu. Um, so that's kind of crazy. I mean, it, it, so the thing is, like, even if you're max, max, once they chip your Shadow Shield... It is still a roll to KO, right? Because you're at 88%. At which point, no, not this one. Uh, this one's at 88%. So at this point, uh, you still have a 40% chance of just dying, um, which is kind of nuts. But it worked out, and uh, gets gets the lit, gets to survive, um, gets the spore off, which is really nice. Switches out into Calyrex, and yeah, it just starts. I I mean, now the Trick Room is up. Now that the Calyrex is spored, I struggle to see how Krell loses this game. Um, yeah, it just gets another spore off. Both the restricted are basically gone. Um, the real limb isn't doing that much. <laughs> I mean, what is what is uh, Maluka gonna do here? But man, that is that is a wild. Uh, yeah, we do see Sash Calyrex, so that's you know pretty standard at this point. That was wild. Holy moly! Like I did not expect that Mimikyu to live. That is crazy. Um, but yeah, I think that it's just kind of click button time. Uh, yeah, real limb goes down. Um, I don't know if we get any information from that flare blitz roll. I don't. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head if we do. Max, max, Mimikyu. That is that is a really interesting set. Um, and we didn't get any item information. We didn't. See, we didn't see a life orb, so it's presumably weakness policy. But uh, interesting. Just okay. Uh, so moving on into game two. Uh, so this time, okay. So this time, I guess. Maybe maybe Krell knew it was a, a roll. Maybe just trying to play a little more conservatively. But uh, Palkia Amoongus is the lead that I thought was probably a little safer, just because you don't immediately get KO'd. Um, you do like, Amoongus is pretty safe here, unless the Calyrex attacks it. And so you can like pretty reasonably. I don't think you want to click Spore because there's a there's the fear of Max Lightning. But like you get to click Max Quake really freely. This team doesn't have a ground immunity and it just has one ground resist in Rillaboom. So like Max Quake into Reggie Alki seems really safe and pretty profitable here. Uh, or you can click Trick Room. But yeah, here we do. We do see the... Uh, okay, so yeah, just, just attacking right into uh, the, the Amoongus. So, like, I believe that in this situation, you maybe don't consider clicking Rage Powder. Obviously, that is really bad into a Max Lightning plus Psy Shock into Palkia, and that's a pretty reasonable play Maluka could make. But on the other hand, if they don't go for that, and you spore, you are in an insane situation, right? If these attacks, if the voltage psi shock goes into Palkia, you are just, you are just, you know, you've won the game. So definitely some mind games that you could play there, but uh, it goes for the safe play, which is also really fair because you are in like a pretty advantageous position here, right? Like you would think Max Quake into Alaki kind of just wins you the game um, or puts you in a really good spot. Although the, giving the Calyrex the plus one is a little spooky. So we see Instant Wars come out. Um, we see that uh, Maluka's Instant Wars is faster. Which is interesting. Um, and I've seen a lot of the uh, Calyrex Ice teams run Jolly in Cinnawar, so it is kind of surprising this one is not. Maybe it is really slow in Cinnawar and slightly faster Calyrex Ice to uh, to proc a weakness policy. That would also be an interesting way of doing it if it's like Assault Vest with the U-turn, potentially. And then Calyrex Dynamax is... Um, Max Psychic is not... Yeah, it's, it's still special. Uh, even off Psy Shock. And so we see Max Quake. I'm a little surprised that... He didn't go just for the KO on Incineroar, but I guess the Calyrex is probably the more the bigger issue. We don't know if the Calyrex has Max Quake, but maybe that was also a play just like to try to nuke this Incineroar while you have the chance, because now the Incineroar kind of just gets to do its thing, right? 
Okay, but now the Zacian comes in. <laughs> and now the Incineroar is threatened. Oh, and it is U-turn. Okay, so it is it is slow Incineroar with U-turn and AV, presumably. So hard switch out. Uh, this is this is. Do you hard switch out here? Do you hard switch out here? Um. But now you are really vulnerable, and we don't see Max Quake, but we do see Sacred Sword. So um, I don't know. I feel like maybe just attacking with Incineroar might have been okay. Maybe not. But now the Palkia kind of goes down. And uh, yeah, this is just like an iffy situation. You have Psychic Terrain up, so you can't even fake out. Calyrex is not doing anything. Um, you, you Maybe you live the attack, and you, you don't live this attack. You don't live this attack. Yeah, that does a little too much. I think, about, I think it does about 60 normally. Uh, 60 went after Intimidate, so 90 normally. Yeah, so just kind of caught... Um, I mean, if you can put Calyrex Station next to each other and the Calyrex has a boost and you, like, you don't have speed control up, it's really scary. So that's a really good job for Maluka, even though, you know, it seemed like it was an awkward situation early on, just like coming back. And I do think that um, Carl needed to find a way to get damage to Calyrex earlier and kind of missed his chance. Um, I mean, let's let's move forward a little bit here. Uh, yeah, so like this turn, the, the fake out did come, come into play, but like... I don't know. The Instar would have been a minus two, so maybe it just didn't KO, but the Calyrex was at pretty low health. Or you KO the Instar when you have the chance, and then you get to... No, I don't know if KOing the Instar does anything better, right? Because you still need the damage on Calyrex, but you have an extra turn of Dynamax. And the extra turn of Dynamax might make the difference because then you threaten the KO on the Zacian. So, but, uh, but even if you threaten the KO the Zacian, you don't have a way to KO the Calyrex, right? It's just going to click Astral Barrage and KO both your Pokemon in the back. So... Yeah, I don't know. That, that's awkward. Maybe, like, if you aren't prioritizing getting Trick Room up, then maybe you just aren't supposed to bring the Calyrex Ice. Maybe bring the Regieleki or the Mimikyu would have been better off. Uh, I don't know. That's a, that's an awkward one, but definitely kind of Maluka turned it around just by positioning better. So good job. And then going on to game three, uh, let's see. Okay, so Mimikyu, Mimikyu, same leads. Um, and this time, okay. So here's the fun thing about Rillaboom. G-Max Rillaboom goes through Disguise. So if Maluka is willing to bet the game on not on Incineroar not switching in, then he can just go for a max G Max drum beating G Max whatever it's called into the Mimikyu, immediately KO it, uh, and he, he's in a great spot, right? No Trick Room goes up. There's no really safe switch in here other than the Incineroar. But I think that that's maybe a little too aggressive. But I guess we'll see if he does that. Okay, so Incineroar does come in. So you kind of read that. Um, and yeah, so that, that, was, that was a little too aggressive. Going for the safer play, going for Astro Barrage. Um, the, other, the other argument for that is like, you can't really switch in the Calyrex, right? Like the, the, cal the or no, you can, right? I mean, you can, like, yeah, this was a really safe play uh, on the Luka's end because even if the Trick Room goes up, which means that you're reading into the really Boom not G-Maxing, um, the Calyrex has to protect on the potential uh, Spore but the real one gets to U-turn off. Um, the Calyrex, if you're sporing, then you can't bring in Cal uh, the Calyrex Ice. And so, and you can, you can bring in the Mimikyu slot, but like, how much, are you really like making progress at that point? Uh, the Incineroar could come in, the Incineroar pressures the Calyrex Ice and also threatens Fake Out on Amoongus. I, I think this is a really safe play, a really good, like a really just fantastic defensive play from Maluka here. Um, and now Trick Room isn't up, and now the Calyrex gets to max and max profitably. Uh, and I mean, once again, once you get into this situation where it's Calyrex next to Zacian, you are just exerting so much pressure, even even though the uh, Zacian is getting intimidated. Um, but I guess this, honestly, maybe this isn't the most okay. This actually hasn't been that profitable at max. Uh, but okay, we do see Incineroar max, so not the most unreasonable play. Calyrex finally gets the boost, but I think it's just going down. And then we just see a Sash. Uh, yeah, Zacian Behemoth Blading. F Why Flare? I guess Flare allows you to threaten the Zacian next turn with a KO, even if the Instant War comes in, and threatens a Rillaboom switch in, which might have been the case, uh, and also just breaks Sash anyways. Okay, that's fair enough, yeah. That's that's a pretty good Flare. Calyrex Ice comes in, and here's just like, Calyrex Ice is doing nothing! Actually, it lives a Behemoth Blade from here, but it does not live a live in Astro Barrage at all. So, you know, I just think that Calyrex Ice is... Not a great Pokemon, and we're kind of seeing why here. Unless it's in, set up so meticulously, it's just doing so little. Um, yeah, so the Astro Barrage has to come out. 
Um, but like, I don't think it matters, right? Like, oh, wow. Okay. So the flare, not even KOing the Calyrex here. If it did KO, I don't know if they're in a better situation, right? Like then you just get to, you have a Incineroar next to your Zacian and the, their Incineroar is at minus two. Uh, and you just get to KO the Calyrex and like, you're fine, right? Yeah, I don't know if that mattered. Like, I know people are, people in chat are going like calcs, but I don't think it mattered at all. Uh, I think that Maluka was in a fine situation regardless of what happened there. Um, and you can see that, you know, uh, he got the double protect anyways, and it just is, is in the same situation and is winning the game from here, I think. Um, just because, like, Zacian kind of just <laughs> does whatever it wants, you know? The Incineroar doesn't get to intimidate it, and when the Incineroar, when Zacian is on the field and Incineroar is on the field and Zacian isn't intimidated, it feels like it's it, you're just in such a strong position. You always want Incineroar in the back against the Zacian. And yeah, so you just immediately see a forfeit. So yeah, two of the best Korean players, honestly, two of the best players in the world playing against each other, really hype matchup, and I think really showcased uh, why Calyrex Ice is a bad Pokemon. That's my takeaway. Um, it did nothing all game, uh, other than game one where it was like set up, and then game two and three it did nothing. Um, but Maluka obviously positioned really well in order to put him in that position. Again, these are the type of replays I love watching. Okay, and back to the spreadsheet, and I do want to cover one more match today, but before I do that, I want to talk about a team that kind of showed up all over the place, which is the team that you see here with Ike versus Astura, uh, Zacian, Dialgo, Rillaboom, Ditto, Urshifu, Grimmsnarl, definitely the most overrepresented team of uh, NPA's week one, and this is kind of what I mean when I say that like NPA uh, kind of showcases what a lot of top players are working on, maybe like projects the future meta a little bit. Um, so we also see it down here. Uh, sorry, we see it here where Pink Sylvie used it against Gavin and Gavin managed to beat it. Uh, and then we also see it uh, down in my match where I played against it uh, when Pontus used it and managed to win against it as well. So really, really highly represented team. Um, obviously seeing a mirror match up here is pretty funny. But then if you keep scrolling up, uh, oh, and then you see it here. Snow also managed to beat Raghav with it. But uh, one set that I want to watch here, the last set of the week is Roxen versus YT. Uh, I was told by my friends on the cruisers that this was an incredible set uh, with some really fun interactions. So I definitely want to check it out and also showcase what is, I think, the team of the week. All right. So like I said, um, we see Roxen using the uh, Dialga, Grimmsnarl, Ditto, Zacian, Urshifu, Rillaboom core. And uh, we see uh, this is this is YT, a Japanese or Australian player uh, using a Raichu, Kyogre, Zacian, Amoongus, Tornadus, and Ditto. Uh, and so this team, I think there was a variant of this team that was pretty popular uh, that I know Billa had been using in some of the Limitless Tours. And uh, I know that that team had fast fake out Grimmsnarl on it and with fake tears. So you could either uh, use speed control for Dialga or you fake tears for Dialga and really overpower teams. But I don't think the Urshifu Rillaboom was on that team until very recently. So I do want to uh, to see what that does. Uh, obviously, again, I played against this team, so I kind of am familiar with it. But I'm curious as to how other people played against it. Um, and it really kind of surprised me, game one, how much damage these Pokemon did. So uh, let's see if uh, YT gets caught off guard too. But we did just see a double protect here, playing really passively. Um, trying to guess, maybe stall at the Dynamax. Maybe just like see what... Uh, like Grimstar, if you don't know what this team does... Grimmsnarl is a really scary Pokemon because it can do a lot of things. Uh, and also, maybe just like knowing that it has Fake Out and trying to scout that out is another possibility. So, yeah, just a, a maybe really safe play, but also you kind of want to get momentum against this team. Um, and so, yeah, so sacking the Amoongus here, just like understanding that there is there is no Pokemon that can switch into a Fake Tier. There's no Dark Types on this team. So there's no Pokemon that can switch into a fake tier's uh, max steel spike, except for maybe the Ditto, but then you're down to like 5% and the Ditto's kind of just dead. So um, kind of sacking a Pokemon here, I'm simply getting a water spat off. And uh, yeah, so you see Sash Grimmsnarl. Uh, again, something that I found out kind of the hard way, but, uh, or actually I was a little, uh, and I was kind of aware of the fact that this was Sash Grimmsnarl because Billa had been using, been using a similar team in Limitless Tours. But um, yeah, so here we see Oh, okay, so that's interesting. So um, we see them both switch into Ditto here. Uh, and the Ditto that switched in first gets to transform, and the Ditto that switched in second cannot transform into a transformed Ditto. So um, fun interaction there, uh, meaning that YT suddenly only really has one Pokemon on the field, can still transform into the Dialga, but has to manually click transform to do that. 
And yeah, the station protects Quake going in, so getting that speed def boost. And now you kind of have to KO the Ditto, but that shouldn't be too hard, right? Like Kyogre, never mind. Kyogre does not KO it because. Wait. Okay, so remember, Ditto copies um, the speed stat of the opposing Pokemon, right? So because the position outsped the Ditto, that means that the Ditto, sorry, this, the Kyogre on YT's team is not timid, it is modest Kyogre. Which I guess is pretty reasonable when you have a, a Raichu and a Tornadus both to spread like Paralysis or Click Tailwind, but um, maybe not something that Roxanne expected to see. Uh, but we do see, yeah, the, the Dialga did have to go for an attack into the Ditto because you really don't want it copying the Dialga. Um, and now uh, YT gets to Dynamax, uh, the Kyogre, which is really safe. There's no real counterplay to that. Um, fake Endization, presumably just to keep the Dialga alive. For a turn, but uh, with Hailstorm, the Diago only gets to live for one more turn, unless there's a Max Geyser coming out here, which maybe there is, but I think you click Max Lightning if you have it. War of Time, doing very little. Um, oh yeah, it's Life Orb Diago, so it was going down anyways. So fair enough, yeah. And that's the uh, that's the game. So okay, so you know YT, I guess probably knew about this team, um, but because because like he did play around the fake out on Grimstar, which is. Obviously, like, a move that it gets and has been occasionally known to use, but not a move that was very common in Series 11, and a lot of, like, the slower Grimstarls are not running it. But in this team, of course, he, like, did play around the Sash and played around Fake Out pretty well, and, like, seemed to have a pretty solid game plan, honestly. Although, uh, the Ditto interactions were pretty funny. Um, I think, honestly, Roxen just kind of expected... Um, oh, I, let's look back at this game state. So, is so is the... Sashin KO'd the Ditto with the play rough here, right? Um, if you know that's happening, you probably just switch out the Ditto. And so I guess Roxon just didn't know the speed stat, which is reasonable. It's not something... Like, it could be slow Zation too, right? If it's not max speed Zation, then you don't outspeed. Then, then any Kyogre should outspeed it. So uh, Roxon learning two things that are really valuable, which is that it's modest Kyogre and it is max speed Zation. Um... Or it's a really slow Kyogre, which seems a little less likely, because you do still want Modest to outspeed Alaki uh, in Tailwind. But yeah, so uh, just like I think maybe Roxanne got caught off guard by that, because if he switched out uh, into you know his own Zation, for example, and KO'd the Ditto, he was in a really good spot and just kind of expected the Water Spouts going off. Maybe a little greedy, but like also a pretty reasonable play. I probably would have done the same thing. So uh, yeah, that was kind of the deciding turn here. Um, but probably could have played it a little more safely. Uh, let's jump into game two. So this time, Roxon opts to lead the Billaboom and Dialga. Um, so no Grimmsnarl. I guess the Grimmsnarl loses a little bit of effectiveness when you don't get to surprise your opponent with it. Uh, the Raichu, of course, gets to fake out faster, breaking Sash and stopping the Grimmsnarl from doing anything turn one. Uh, but, you know, Rillaboom a really good lead into Kyogre. So this seems like favorable for Roxon, right? Of course, Dialga maxing. Raichu does run Eerie Impulse, but it might not be able to click it turn one because of the um, the Rillaboom threatening to click Fake Out, right? But if it does click Eerie Impulse, Dialga is a lot less effective. Oh, just clicking Helping Hand. Yeah, so fair enough. The Roxanne did have to go for Fake Out. Um, yeah, so Roxanne did have to prioritize KOing the Raichu. Turning off uh, Rain is really effective, but I think that the uh, YT probably went for Hailstorm too. Yeah, just picking up that KO. Um, makes sense, makes sense. Um, so just trading KOs, I think both people kind of expected it, and, oh no, wait, hold up, hold up, this is the, this is the turn that people were talking about, um, I'm, I'm going, um, we'll, we'll get back there, so, okay, so, they, they both take KOs, uh, and then, so, Roxon, so, YT switches in Ditto, Roxon switches in Ditto, Roxon's Ditto transforms into the opposing Ditto, right, and so Ditto can't transform into Ditto. It just can't transform into a transformed Ditto. But because Roxanne's Ditto is faster, or they speed tied, Roxanne's Ditto transformed first, and Ditto cannot transform into a transformed Ditto, and so YT's Ditto did not transform. Really funny interaction, but it also means that because your Ditto is transformed, transform will fail. So here we see Dialga taking the KO, really not wanting that Ditto to get transform into his Dialga, Geyser just uh, putting that Dialga down to, or just putting that Ditto down to really low health because of the Max Quake boost, and then Ditto clicking Transform and it failing. So I know Roxon was talking about being surprised by this, but that is a really funny mechanic that we all got to learn because of this set. 
<laughs> and so ditto coming back out so ditto of course not having the opportunity to transform um because it is still across from this ditto that can't transform so maybe it even worked out that uh the ditto just stayed on the field um and yeah so i okay i mean maybe yt was not supposed to target the ditto because the ditto could not click transform here right um and we did see the dialga not fail to ko uh yt's ditto so the, the ditto is going to get the K, uh, get to transform. Maybe that was intentional. You could have clicked steel spike, right? But uh, you know, fair enough. Uh, getting that that ditto transformed, so it's not just a, a, you know a blob. Uh, Roxen switching in Zacian, of course, very good Pokemon in the situation. Um, and yeah, so we see Zacian moving first. So Zacian does have to be the Dialga, which I guess makes sense. I don't. I can't imagine you run timid Dialga on this team. You have to run modest, and it does not no you know it's yes yeah, the same speed stat as kyogre so you'd have to run timid to outspeedization so it makes sense that the ditto does not outspeedization a little surprising that uh that roxon didn't ko the dialga um with the zation and then opted to just sacred toward the kyogre but uh fair enough um i guess that it didn't really matter too much i guess it was it was there a situation where that went poorly um Zacian Sacred Sword. Sacred Sword does the most damage to Kyogre. Kyogre doesn't actually KO plus two Dialga ever anyways. So it doesn't really matter. Um, the scary thing is if like Ditto crits is crits the earth power is like the thing that you have to really prepare for, I think. Uh, I guess Ditto critting is less likely than Kyogre freezing. So getting damage into Kyogre and reducing that clock of potential freezes is um, probably the right line of play. Uh, okay, sure. Yeah, I buy that. So Broxen probably made the right play there. Um, making the safe play, just click in Earth Power and, you know, uh, getting, yeah, one chance to freeze. Honestly, probably should have been two, because, but Roar of Time missing was the reason that it would have been two. Is that true? Yeah, I think it must be true. I think Roar of Time chaos from there, for sure. So, yep, interesting game. Game two, lots of fun, you know, mechanics to, to watch. Uh, <laughs> love, love learning stuff. So, game three, the, the all-important game three. Um, okay, so this time we see the same Rillaboom Dialga lead, and this time we see YT lead Amoongus. A little interesting, because obviously it doesn't do much into this Rillaboom lead, right? Like, I kind of like the Raichu lead. It covered for a lot, uh, but this was the lead from game one. I just don't think it does anything into Rillaboom either. I guess you get to click Spore at the very least. Uh, and yeah, so we see the Double Protect just stalling this fake out out. Roxin smartly not wasting a turn of Dynamax into this. Um, we see the Dialga get transformed into and then a sw so like i don't know what yt was expecting right because like amoongus was clear like roxon was always leading dialga he could have lead grimstrahl again he also could have led rillaboom again he i don't think he leads zation i don't think he leads urshifu i don't think he brings urshifu i don't think he leads ditto because leading ditto is really volatile right so it's one of those two things so in which case if you're going if your game plan is to double protect and then switch out Amoongus, why are you leading Amoongus, right? You can definitely figure out something a little more profitable than that. Um I was just checking like if timer was on at the beginning of the game, because there are some rules about timer in NPA. Uh you can't turn on timer until after game one's team preview, but you can turn it on for team preview game two and three, um, provided both players are like ready. So and then after turn one starts, you'll have to turn on timer. So that's kind of the rules there. Um, but it looked like he was under time pressure, but I, he didn't like run out of time by any means. He still had plenty of time before when he made his decision. So like, I just, I did not like that lead. If that was your line, maybe you find out a better line. Maybe you just click Spore into Dialga. Like that's a fine line, right? You're potentially taking a hailstorm, right? And that's what we kind of covered for. But uh, I just don't like the, I don't know. Is it just like try to stall at the Dynamax and then, you know, kind of get called out on because Max Quake was really safe there. Um, and now if that Amoongus had clicked Spore, you're in such a good spot, but they just didn't. And now the, the Dialga is just taking a KO every turn and, and Roxxon's falling so far ahead. Sorry, not falling, four star. <laughs> and Roxxon's just moving so far ahead, excuse me. Um, yeah. Yeah, so this game is kind of a blowout. Uh, but game two was really fun, right? I don't think that the Kyogre can ever come back on its own game three, but um, yeah, I, I I thought that this was the first two games were really interesting. I love watching the Ditto mechanics, but man, um, 
YT's game plan game three just did not resonate with me at all. I think that like, again, you this was not a surprising lead from Roxon. You 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 knew that one of two things was happening. Either it was going to be Rillaboom Dialga or it was going to be Grimstarl Dialga. And we saw what happened when you let Amoongus into Grimstarl Dialga game one. And if this was the game plan into Rillaboom Dialga, like why are you bleeding it? I, I just I just didn't like that at all. Um yeah, so again, good games. I get really cool display of what this Dialga team can do. It really was the flavor of the week this week. And uh, yeah, so that, that was fun. Next week, uh, I would like to cover more games. Let me know what you think of this sort of analysis and if you like this um, and if you want to uh, see more of this in the comments down below. And also uh, let me know if there are any matches that you saw and that you want me to cover that you think are especially interesting or just looking at the, these pairings at any matches that you really want to see. Um, obviously the big one for me is me playing one of my uh, my closest team building partners and friends, Gavin Michaels. Uh, that's going to be a really hype matchup. But I see, I mean, the fact that NPA changed the pairing so that uh, the top players on each team play each other means that you have some really, really hype matches. I mean, Joe UX9 versus Snow are just two, I think maybe the top Asian player versus the top American player right here. Um, you see Maluka versus Bingji, um, which is another like the top Korean player versus uh, maybe the best Chinese player. Um, uh, you see like Unreality, Aaron Trailer versus Jamie Boyd, two really old players who are really, really successful. Um, I'm I'm just, this is, this is such a hype format. Uh, there's so many matchups that I'm excited to watch. And uh, yeah, let me know what you think. Let me know if, if there are any matchups that you want to see, and hopefully I can do this again next week. And until next time, I will see you all later.